Hello, and welcome back to Storytime Classics Live, produced by Southwest Shakespeare Company. I am your host, Bo Heckman, and today we will be continuing in the short story collection of Ray Bradbury titled The Illustrated Man. So we'll be continuing with that. The story we'll be picking up with today will be, drumroll please, The Visitor. That's not ominous at all. So we'll just jump right into that. Hope you're having a great Wednesday today. And The Visitor by Ray Bradbury. Saul Williams awoke to the still morning. He looked wearily out of his tent and thought about how far away Earth was. Millions of miles, he thought. But then, what could you do about it? Your lungs were full of the blood rust. You coughed all the time. Saul arose this particular morning at seven o'clock. He was a tall man, lean, thinned by his illness. It was a quiet morning on Mars, with the Dead Sea bottom flat and silent, no wind on it. The sun was clear and cool in the empty sky. He washed his face and ate breakfast. After, he wanted very much to be back on Earth. During the day, he tried every way that it was possible to be in New York City. Sometimes, if he sat right and held his hands a certain way, he did it. He could almost smell New York. Most of the time, though, it was impossible. Later in the morning, Saul tried to die. He lay on the sand and told his heart to stop. It continued beating. He imagined himself leaping from a cliff or cutting his wrists, but laughed to himself. He knew he lacked the nerve for either act. Maybe if I squeeze tight and think about it enough, I'll just sleep and never wake, he thought. He tried it. An hour later he awoke with a month full of blood, with a mouth full of blood. He got up and spat it out and felt very sorry for himself. This blood rust, it filled your mouth and your nose. It ran from your ears, your fingernails, and it took a year to kill you. The only cure was shoving you in a rocket and shooting you out to exile on Mars. There was no known cure on Earth, and remaining there would contaminate and kill others. So here he was, bleeding all the time and lonely. Saul's eyes narrowed. In the distance, by an ancient city ruin, he saw another man lying on a filthy blanket. When Saul walked up, the man on the blanket stirred weakly. Hello, Saul, he said. Another morning, said Saul. Christ, I'm lonely. It is an affliction of the rusted ones, said the man on the blanket, not moving. Very pale, as if he might vanish if you touched him. I wish to God, said Saul, looking down at the man, that you could at least talk. Why is it that intellectuals never get the blood rust and come up here? It is a conspiracy against you, Saul, said the man, shutting his eyes, too weary to keep them open. Once I had the strength to be an intellectual. Now it's a job to think. If only we could talk, said Saul Williams. The other man merely shrugged indifferently. Come tomorrow. Perhaps I'll have enough strength to talk about Aristotle then. I'll try. Really, I will. The man sank down under the worn tree. He opened one eye. Remember, once we did talk on Aristotle, six months ago. And that good day, on that good day I had. I remember, said Saul, not listening. He looked at the Dead Sea. I wish I were as sick as you. Then maybe I wouldn't worry about being an intellectual. Then maybe I'd get some peace. 
You'll get just as bad as I am now in about six months, said the dying man. Then you won't care about anything but sleep and more sleep. Sleep will be like a woman to you. You'll always go back to her because she's fresh and good and faithful, and she'll always treat you kindly and the same. You only wake up so you can think about going back to sleep. It's a nice thought. The man's voice was a bare whisper. Now it stopped, and a light breathing took over. Saul walked off. Along the shores of the Dead Sea, like so many emptied bottles flung up by some long-gone grave, were the huddled bodies of sleeping men. Saul could see them all down the curve of the empty sea. One, two, three, all of them sleeping alone, most of them worse off than he, each with his little cache of food, each grown into himself, because social converse was weakening and sleep was good. At first, there had been a few nights around mutual campfires, and they had all talked about earth. That was the only thing they talked about. Earth and the way the waters ran in town creeks, and what homemade strawberry pie tasted like, and how New York looked in the early morning coming over on the Jersey Ferry in the salt wind. I want earth, thought Saul. I want it so bad it hurts. I want something I can never have again. And they all want it, and it hurts them not to have it. More than food, or a woman, or anything. I just want earth. This sickness puts women away forever. They're not things to be wanted. But earth, yes. That's a thing for the mind and not the weak body. The bright metal flashed on the sky. Saul looked up. The bright metal flashed again. A minute later, the rocket landed on the sea bottom. A valve opened. A man stepped out, carrying his luggage with him. Two other men in protective germicide suits accompanied him, bringing out vast cases of food, setting up a tent for him. Another minute, and the rocket returned to the sky. The exile stood alone. Saul began to run. He hadn't run in weeks, and it was very tiring. But he ran and yelled, Hello! Hello! The young man looked Saul up and down when he arrived. Hello! So, this is Mars. My name's Leonard Mark. I'm Saul Williams. They shook hands. Leonard Mark was very young, only 18, very blonde, pink-faced, blue-eyed, and fresh in spite of his illness. How are things in New York, said Saul. Like this, said Leonard Mark, and he looked at Saul. New York grew up out of the desert, made of stone and filled with March winds. Neons exploded in electric color. Yellow taxis glided in a still night. Bridges rose and tugs chanted in the midnight harbors. Curtains rose on spangled musicals. Saul put his hands to his head violently. Hold on, hold on, he cried. What's happening to me? What's wrong with me? Am I? I'm going crazy. Leaves sprouted from trees in Central Park, green and new. On the pathway, Saul strolled along, smelling the air. Stop it! Stop it, you fool! Shout, Saul shouted at himself. He pressed his forehead with his hands. This can't be! It is, said Leonard Mark. The New York towers faded. Mars returned. Saul stood on the empty sea bottom, staring limply at the young newcomer. You, he said, putting his hand out to Leonard Mark. You did it. You did it with your mind. Yes, said Leonard Mark. Silently, they stood facing each other. Finally, trembling, 
Saul seized the other exile's hand and wrung it again and again, saying, Oh, but I'm glad you're here. You can't know how glad I am. They drank their rich brown coffee from the tin cups. It was high noon. They had been talking all through the warm morning time. And this ability of yours, said Saul over his cup, looking steadily at the young Leonard Mark. It's just something I was born with, said Mark, looking into his drink. My mother was in the blow-up of London back in 57. I was born ten months later. I don't know what you'd call my ability. Telepathy? And thought transference, I suppose. I used to have an act. I traveled all around the world. Leonard Mark, the mental marvel, they said on the billboards. I was pretty well off. Most people thought I was a charlatan. You know what people think of theatrical folks. Only I knew I was really genuine. But I didn't let anybody know. It was safer not to let it get around too much. Oh, a few of my close friends knew about my real ability. I had a lot of talents that will come in handy now that I'm here on Mars. You sh sure scared the hell out of me, said Saul, his cup rigid in his hand. When New York came right up out of the ground that way, I thought I was insane. It's a form of hypnotism which affects all the sensual organs at once. Eyes, ears, nose, mouth, skin, all of them. What would you like to be doing now, most of all? Saul put down his cup. He tried to hold his hands very steady. He wet his lips. I'd like to be in a little creek I used to swim in in Mellontown, Illinois, when I was a kid. I'd like to be stark naked and swimming. Well, said Leonard Mark, and moved his head ever so little. Saul fell back in the sand, his eyes shut. Leonard Mark sat watching him. Saul lay on the sand, from time to time, his hands moved, twitched excitedly. His mouth spasmed open. Sounds issued from his tightening and relaxing throat. Saul began to make slow movements of his arms out and back, out and back. Gasping with his head to one side, his arms going and coming slowly on the warm air, stirring the yellow sand under him, his body turning slowly over. Leonard Mark quietly finished his coffee. While he drank, he kept his eyes on the moving, whispering Saul, lying there on the Dead Sea bottom. All right, said Leonard Mark. Saul sat up, rubbing his face. After a moment, he told Leonard Mark, I saw the creek. I ran along the bank and I took off my clothes, he said breathlessly. His smile incredulous, and I dived in and swam around. I'm pleased, said Mark. Here, Saul reached into his pocket and drew forth his last bar of chocolate. This is for you. What's this? Leonard Mark looked at the gift. Chocolate? Nonsense. I'm not doing this for pay. I'm doing it because it makes you happy. Put that thing back in your pocket before I turn it into a rattlesnake and it bites you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Saul put it away. I don't know how good that water was. He fetched the coffee pot. More? Pouring the coffee, Saul shut his eyes a moment. I've got Socrates here, he thought. Socrates and Pluto and Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. This man, by his talk, is a genius. By his talent, he's incredible. Think of the long, easy days and the cool nights of talk we'll have. It won't be a bad year at all. 
Not half. He spilled the coffee. What's wrong? Nothing. Saul himself was confused, startled. We'll be in Greece, he thought. In Athens. We'll be in Rome if we want. When we study the Roman writers, we'll stand in the Parthenon and the Acropolis. It won't be just talk but it'll be a place to be besides. This man can do it. He has the power to do it. When we talk the plays of Racine, he can make a stage and players and all of it for me. By Christ, this is better than life ever was. How much better to be sick and here than well on earth without these abilities. How many people have ever seen a Greek drama played in a Greek amphitheater in the year 31 BC? And if I ask, quietly and earnestly, will this man take on the aspect of Schopenhauer and Darwin and Bergeson and all the other thoughtful men of the ages? Yes. Why not? to sit and talk with Nietzsche in person, with Plato himself. There was only one thing wrong. Saul felt himself swaying. The other men, the other sick ones along the bottom of this dead sea. In the distance, men were moving, walking toward them. They had seen the rocket flash, land, dislodge a passenger. Now they were coming slowly, painfully, to greet the new arrival. Saul was cold. Look, he said, Mark, I think we'd better head for the mountains. Why? See those men coming? Some of them are insane. Really? Yes. Isolation and all make them that way. Yes. That's it. We'd better get moving. They don't look very dangerous. They move slowly. You'd be surprised. Mark looked at Saul. You're trembling. Why's that? There's no time to talk, said Saul, getting up swiftly. Come on. Don't you realize what'll happen once they discover your talent? They'll fight over you. They'll kill each other. Kill you for the right to own you. Oh, but I don't, I don't belong to anybody, said Leonard Mark. He looked at Saul. Not even you. Saul jerked his head. I, I didn't even think of that. Didn't you now? Mark laughed. We haven't time to argue, answered Saul, eyes blinking, cheeks blazing. Come on. I don't want to. I'm going to sit right here, until those men show up. You're a little too possessive. My life's my own. Saul felt an ugliness in himself. His face began to twist. You heard what I said. How very quickly you changed from a friend to an enemy, observed Mark. Saul hit at him. It was a neat, quick blow coming down. Mark ducked aside, laughing. No, you don't. They were in the center of Times Square. Cars roared, hooting upon them. Buildings plunged up, hot, into the blue air. It's a lie, cried Saul, staggering under the visual impact. For God's sake, Ma don't, Mark. The men are coming. You'll be killed. Mark sat there on the pavement, laughing at his joke. Let them come. I can fool them all. New York distracted Saul. It was meant to distract, meant to keep his attention with its unholy beauty, after so many months away from it. Instead of attacking Mark, he could only stand, drinking in the alien but familiar scene. He shut his eyes. No. And he fell forward, dragging Mark with him. Horns screamed in his ears. 
Brakes hissed and caught violently. He smashed at Mark's chin. Silence. Mark lay on the sea bottom. Taking the unconscious man in his arms, Saul began to run, heavily. New York was gone. There was only the wide soundlessness of the Dead Sea. The men were closing in around him. He headed for the hills with his precious cargo, with New York and green country and fresh springs and old friends held in his arms. He fell once and struggled up. He did not stop running. Night filled the cave. The wind wandered in and out, tugging at the small fire, scattering ashes. Mark opened his eyes. He was tied with ropes and leaning against the dry wall of the cave, facing the fire. Saul put another stick on the fire, glancing now and again with cat-like nervousness at the cave entrance. You're a fool. Saul started. Yes, said Mark. You're a fool. They'll find us. If they have to hunt for six months, they'll find us. They saw New York at a distance, like a mirage, and us in the center of it. It's, it's too much to think they won't be curious and follow our trail. I'll move on with you then, said Saul, staring into the fire, and they'll come after. Shut up. Mark smiled. Is that the way to speak to your wife? You heard me. Oh, a fine marriage this is. Your greed and my mental ability. What do you want me to see now? Shall I show you a few more of your childhood scenes? Saul felt the sweat coming out on his brow. He didn't know if the man was joking or not. Yes, he said. All right, said Mark. Watch. Flame gushed out of the rocks. Sulfur choked him. Pits of brimstone exploded. Concussions rocked the cave. Heaving up, Saul coughed and blundered, burned, withered by hell. Hell went away. The cave returned. Mark was laughing. Saul stood over him. You, he said coldly, bending down. What else do you expect, cried Mark, to be tied up? toted off, made the intellectual bride of a man insane with loneliness. Do you think I enjoy this? I'll untie you if you promise not to run away. I couldn't promise that. I'm a free agent. I don't belong to anybody. Saul got down on his knees. But you've got to belong. Do you hear? You've got to belong. I can't let you go away. My dear fellow, the more you say things like that, the more remote I am. If you'd had any sense and done things intelligently, we'd have been friends. I'd have been glad to do you these little hypnotic favors. After all, they're no trouble for me to conjure up. Fun, really. But you botched it. You wanted me all to yourself. You were afraid the others would take me away from you. Um, how mistaken you were. I have enough power to keep them all happy. You could have shared me. Like a community kitchen. I'd have felt quite like a god among children, being kind doing favors, in return for which you might bring me little gifts, special tidbits of food. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, Saul cried. But I know those men too well. Are you any different? Hardly. Go out and see if they're coming. I thought I heard a noise. 
Saul ran. In the cave entrance, he cupped his hands, peering down into the night-filled gully. Dim shapes stirred. Was it only the wind blowing the roving clumps of weeds? He began to tremble, a fine, aching tremble. I don't see anything. He came back into an empty cave. He stared at the fireplace. Mark! Mark was gone. There was nothing but the cave, filled with boulders, stones, pebbles, the lonely fire flickering, the wind sighing, and Saul standing there, incredulous and numb. Mark! Mark! Come back! The man had worked free of his bonds, slowly, carefully, and using the ruse of his imagining, he heard other men approaching, had gone. Where? The cave was deep, but ended in a blank wall, and Mark could not have slipped past him into the night. How then? Saul stepped around the fire. He drew his knife and approached a large boulder that stood against the cave wall. Smiling, he pressed the knife against the boulder. Smiling, he tapped the knife there. Then he drew his knife back to plunge it into the boulder. Stop! shouted Mark. The boulder vanished. Mark was there. Saul suspended his knife. The fire played on his cheeks. His eyes were quite insane. It didn't work, he whispered. He reached down and put his hands on Mark's throat and closed his fingers. Mark said nothing, but moved uneasily in the grip. His eyes ironic, telling things to Saul that Saul knew. If you kill me, the eyes said. Where will all your dreams be? If you kill me, where will all the streams and brook trout be? Kill me. Kill Plato. Kill Aristotle. Kill Einstein. Yes, kill all of us. Go ahead. Strangle me. I dare you. Saul's fingers released the throat. Shadows moved in the cave mouth. Both men turned their heads. The other men were there, five of them, haggard with travel, panting, waiting in the outer rim of light. Good evening, called Mark, laughing. Come in! Come in, gentlemen! By dawn, the arguments and ferocities still continued. Mark sat among the glaring men, rubbing his wrists, newly released from his bonds. He created a mahogany-paneled conference hall and a marble table at which they all sat, ridiculously bearded, evil-smelling, sweating and greedy men, eyes bent upon their treasure. The way to settle it, said Mark at last, is for each of you to have certain hours of certain days for appointments with me. I'll treat you all equally. I'll be city property, free to come and go. That's fair enough. As for Saul here, he's on probation. When he's proved he can be a civil person once more, I'll give him a treatment or two. Until that time, I have nothing more to do with him. The other exiles grinned at Saul. I'm sorry, Saul said. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm all right now. We'll see, said Mark. Let's give ourselves a month, shall we? The other men grinned at Saul. Saul said nothing. He sat staring at the floor of the cave. 
Let's see now, said Mark. On Mondays, it's your day, Smith. Smith nodded. On Tuesdays, I'll take Peter there for an hour or so. Peter nodded. On Wednesdays, I'll finish up with Johnson, Holtzman, and Jim here. The last three men looked at each other. The rest of the week, I'm to be left strictly alone. Do you hear? Mark told them. A little should be better than nothing. If you don't obey, I won't perform at all. Maybe we'll make you perform, said Johnson. He caught the other men's eye. Look, we're five against this one. We can make him do anything we want. If we cooperate, we've got a real thing here. Don't be idiots, Mark warned the other men. Let me talk, said Johnson. He's telling us what he'll do. Why don't we tell him? Are we bigger than him or not? And him threatening not to perform. Well, just let me get a sliver of wood under his toenails and maybe burn his fingers a bit with a steel file. We'll see if he performs. Why shouldn't we have performances? I want to know. Every night in the week. Don't listen to him, said Mark. He's crazy. He can't be depended on. You know what he'll do. Don't you? He'll get you all off guard, one by one, and kill you. Yes, kill all of you, so that when he's done, he'll be alone. Just him and me. That's his sort. The listening men blinked, first at Mark, then at Johnson. For that matter, observed Mark, none of you can trust the others. This is a fool's conference. The minute your back is turned, one of the other men will murder you. I dare say at the week's end, you'll all be dead or dying. A cold wind blew into the mahogany room. It began to dissolve and became a cave once more. Mark was tired of his joke. The marble table splashed and rained and evaporated. The men gazed suspiciously at each other with little bright animal eyes. What was spoken was true. They saw each other in the days to come, surprising one another, killing until that last lucky one remained to enjoy the intellectual treasure that walked around among them. Saul watched them and felt alone and disquieted. Once you have made a mistake, how hard to admit your wrongness, to go back, start fresh. They were all wrong. They had been lost a long time. Now, they were worse than lost. And to make matters very bad, said Mark at last, one of you has a gun. All the rest of you have only knives, but one of you, I know, has a gun. Everybody jumped up. Search, said Mark. Find the one with the gun, or you're all dead. That did it. The men plunged wildly about, not knowing whom to search first. Their hands grappled. They cried out and Mark watched them in contempt. Johnson fell back, feeling in his jacket. All right, he said. We might as well have it over now. Here, you, Smith. And he shot Smith through the chest. Smith fell. The other men yelled. They broke apart. Johnson aimed and fired twice more. Stop, cried Mark. New York soared up around them, out of the rock and cave and sky. Sun glinted on high towers. The elevated thundered. Tugs blew in the harbor. The green lady stared across the bay, a torch in her hand. Look, you fools, said Mark. Central Park broke out of constellations of spring blossoms. The wind blew fresh-cut lawn smells over them in a wave. And in the center of New York, bewildered, 
The men f stumbled. Johnson fired his gun three times more. Saul ran forward. He crashed against Johnson, bore him down, wrenched the gun away. It fired again. The men stopped smiling. They stood. Saul lay across Johnson. They ceased struggling. There was a terrible silence. The men stood watching. New York sank down into the sea with a hissing, bubbling, sighing. With a cry of ruined metal and old time, the great structures leaned, warped, flowed, collapsed. Mark stood among the buildings. Then, like a building, a neat red hole drilled into his chest. Wordless, he fell. Saul lay staring at the men, at the body. He got up, the gun in his hand. Johnson did not move. He was afraid to move. They all shut their eyes and opened them again, thinking that by so doing they might reanimate the man who lay before them. The cave was cold. Saul stood up and looked remotely at the gun in his hand. He took it and threw it far out over the valley and did not watch it fall. They looked down at the body as if they could not believe it. Saul bent down and took hold of the limp hand. Leonard, he said softly. Leonard? He shook the hand. Leonard! Leonard Mark did not move. His eyes were shut. His chest had ceased going up and down. He was getting cold. Saul got up. We've killed him, he said, not looking at the men. His mouth was filling with a raw liquor now. The only one we didn't want to kill, we killed. He put his shaking hand to his eyes. The other men stood waiting. Get a spade, said Saul. Bury him. He turned away. I'll have nothing to do with you. Somebody walked off to find a spade. Saul was so weak he couldn't move. His legs were grown into the earth with roots of feeding deep of loneliness and fear and the cold of the night. The fire had almost died out, and now there was only the double moonlight riding over the blue mountains. There was the sound of someone digging in the earth with a spade. We, we don't need him anyhow, said somebody much too loudly. The sound of digging went on. Saul walked off slowly and let himself slide down the side of a dark tree until he reached and was sitting blankly in the sand, his hands blindly in his lap. Sleep, he thought. We'll all go to sleep now. We have that much, anyway. Go to sleep and try to dream off, dream of New York and all the rest. He closed his eyes wearily, the blood gathering in his nose and his mouth and in his quivering eyes. How did he do it? He asked in a tired voice. His head fell forward on his chest. How did he bring New York up here and make us walk around in it? Let's try. It shouldn't be too hard. Think. Think of New York he whispered, falling down into sleep. New York and Central Park, and then Illinois in the spring, apple blossoms and green grass. It didn't work. It wasn't the same. New York was gone, and nothing he could do would bring it back. He would rise every morning and walk on the Dead Sea, looking for it, and walk forever around Mars, looking for it, and never find it and finally lie, 
too tired to walk, trying to find New York in his head, but not finding it. The last thing he heard before he slept was the spade rising and falling and digging a hole into which, with a tremendous crash of metal and golden mitts and odor and color and sound, New York collapsed, fell, and was buried. He cried all night in his sleep. The next story is the concrete mixer. He listened to the dry grass rustle of the old witches, voices beneath his open window. Etel, the coward. Etel, the refuser. Etel, who will not wage the glorious war of Mars against Earth. Speak on, witches, he cried. The voices dropped to a murmur like that of water in the log canals under the Martian sky. Etel, the father of a son who must grow up in the shadow of this horrid knowledge, said the old wrinkled woman. They knocked their sly-eyed heads gently together. Shame, shame! His wife was crying on the other side of the room. Her tears were as rain, numerous and cool, on the tiles. Oh, Etel, how can you think this way? Etel laid aside his metal book, which, at his beckoning, had been singing him a story all morning from its thin, golden-wired frame. I've tried to explain, he said. This is a foolish thing, Mars invading Earth. We'll be destroyed, utterly. Outside, a banging, crashing boom, a surge of brass, a drum, a cry, marching feet, pennants, and songs. Through the stone sheets, the army, fire weapons to shoulder, stamped. Children skipped after. Old women waved dirty flags. I shall remain on Mars and read a book, said Etel. A blunt knock on the door. Tyler answered. Father-in-law stormed in. What's this I hear about my son-in-law? A traitor? Yes, father. You're not fighting in the Martian army. No, father. Got, the old father turned very red. A plague on your name. You'll be shot. Shoot me then. Have it over. Whoever heard of a Martian not invading? Who? Nobody. It is, I admit, quite incredible. Incredible, hussed the witch's witch voice under the window. Father, can't you reason with him, demanded Tyler. Reason with a dung heap, cried Father, eyes blazing. He came and stood over Etel. Bands playing, a fine day, women weeping, children jumping, everything right, men marching bravely. And you sit here. Oh, shame. Shame, sobbed the faraway voices in the hedge. Get the devil out of my house with your inane chatter, said Ethel, exploding. Take your medals and your drums and run. He shoved father-in-law past a screaming wife, only to have the door thrown wide at his movement. As a military detail entered, a voice shouted, Etelvry? Yes? You are under arrest. Goodbye, my dear wife. I am off to the wars with these fools, shouted Etel, dragged through the door by the men in bronze mesh. Goodbye. Goodbye, said the town witches, fading away. The cell was neat and clean, without a book, 
Etel was nervous. He gripped the bars and watched the rockets shoot up into the night air. The stars were cold and numerous. They seemed to scatter when every rocket blasted up among them. Fools, whispered Etel. Fools! The cell door opened. One man with a kind of vehicle entered, full of books. Books here, there, everywhere in the chambers of the vehicle. Behind him, the military... A senor loomed. Etelvere, we want to know why you had these illegal earth books in your house. These copies of wonder stories, scientific tales, fantastic stories. Explain. The man gripped Etel's wrist. Etel shook him free. If you're going to shoot me, shoot me. That literature from Earth is the very reason why I won't try to invade them. It's the reason why your invasion will fail. How so? The Asenor scowled and turned to the yellowed magazines. Pick any copy, said Etel. Any one at all. Nine out of ten stories in the years 1929, 30 through 50, Earth calendar, have every Martian invasion successfully invading Earth. Ah. The Asenir smiled, nodded, and then said Etel, Failing. That's treason. Owning such literature. So be it, if you wish. But let me draw a few conclusions. Invariably, each invasion is thwarted by a young man, usually lean, usually Irish, usually alone, named Mick or Rick or Jick or Bannon, who destroys the Martians. You don't believe that? No. I don't believe Earthmen can actually do that, no. But they have a background, understand? A senior, of generations of children reading just such fiction, absorbing it. They have nothing but a literature of invasion successfully thwarted. Can you say the name for Martian literature? Well, no, I guess not. You know not. We never wrote stories of such a fantastic nature. Now we rebel, we attack and we shall die. I don't see your reasoning on that. Where does this tie in with the magazine stories? Morale. A big thing. The Earthmen know they can't fail. It is in them like blood beating in their veins. They cannot fail. They will repel each invasion, no matter how well organized. Their youth of reading just such fiction as this has given them a faith we cannot equal. We, Martians, we are uncertain. We know that we might fail. Our morale is low, in spite of the banged drums and tooted horns. I won't listen to this treason, cried the Asenor. This fiction will be burned as you will be, within the next ten minutes. You have a choice, Etelvrai. Join the Legion of War or burn. It is a choice of deaths. I choose to burn. Men. He was hustled out into the courtyard. There he saw his carefully hoarded reading matter set to the torch. A special pit was prepared, with olive five feet deep in it, with oil five feet deep in it. This, with a great thunder, was set afire. Into this, in a minute, he would be pushed. On the far side of the courtyard, in shadow, 
he noticed the solemn figure of Sun standing alone, his great yellow eyes luminous with sorrow and fear. He did not put out his hand to speak, but only looked at his father like some dying animal, a wordless animal seeking rescue. Etel looked at the flaming pit. He felt the rough hand seize him, strip him, push him forward to the hot perimeter of death. Only then did Etel swallow and cry out, Wait! The Asinir's face, bright with orange fire, pushed forward in the trembling air. What is it? I will join the Legion of War, replied Etel. Good! Release him! The hands fell away. As he turned, he saw his son standing far across the court, waiting. His son was not smiling, only waiting. In the sky, a bronze rocket leaped across the stars, ablaze. And now we bid goodbye to those stalwart warriors, said the Asenor. The band thumped and wind blew a fine, sweet rain of tears gently upon the sweating army. The children cavorted. In the chaos, Etel saw his wife weeping with pride, his son solemn and silent at her side. They marched into the ship, everybody laughing and brave. They buckled themselves into their spider webs. All through the tense ship, the spider webs were filled with lounging, lazy men. They chewed on bits of food and waited. A great lid slammed shut, a valve hissed. Off to earth and destruction, whispered Etel. What? asked someone. Off to glorious victory, said Etel, grimacing. The rocket jumped. Space, thought Etel. Here we are, banging across black inks and pink lights of space in a brass kettle. Here we are, a celebratory rocket heaved out to fill the earthmen's eyes with fear flames as they look up into the sky. What is it like being far, far away from your home, your wife, your child, here and now? He tried to analyze his trembling. It was like trying your most secret inward working organs to Mars and then jumping out a million miles. Your heart was still on Mars pumping, glowing. Your brain was still on Mars, thinking, crenulated, like an abandoned torch. Your stomach was still on Mars, somnolent, trying to digest the final dinner. Your lungs were still in the cool blue wine air of Mars a soft folded bellows screaming for release, one part of you longing for the rest. For here you were, a meshless, cogless automation, a body upon which officials had performed clinical autopsy and left all of you that counted back upon the empty seas and strewn over the darkened hills. Here you were, bottle empty, fireless, chill, with only your hands to give death to earthmen. A pair of hands is all you are now, he thought in cold remoteness. Here you lie in the tremendous web. Others are about you, but they are whole. Whole hearts and bodies. But all of you that lives is back there, walking the desolate seas and evening winds. This thing here, this cold clay thing, is already dead. Attack stations, attack stations, attack! Ready, ready, ready! Up! Out of the webs, quick! Etel moved. Somewhere before him, his two cold hands moved. How swift it all has been, he thought. A year ago, one Earth rocket reached Mars. Our scientists, with their incredible telepathic ability, copied it. Our workers, with their incredible plants, reproduced it a hundredfold. No other Earth ship has reached Mars since then, and yet we know their language perfectly, all of us. We know their culture, their logic, and we shall pay the price of our brilliance. Guns on the ready, 
Right. Sights. Meeting by Miles. 10,000. Attack. A humming silence. A silence of insects throbbing in the walls of the rocket. The insect singing of tiny bobbins and levers and whirls of wheels. Silence of waiting men. Silence of glands emitting the slow, steady pulse of sweat under arm, on brow, under staring pale eyes. Wait! Ready! Etel hung onto his sanity with his fingernails. Hung hard and long. Silence! Silence! Silence. Waiting. Tee! What's that? Earth Radio. Cut them in. They're trying to reach us. Call us. Cut them in. Here they are. Listen. Calling Martian Invasion Fleet. The listening silence. The insect hum pulling back to let the sharp Earth voice crack in upon the rooms of waiting men. But this is Earth calling. This is William Summers, president of the Association... Association of United American Producers. Etel held tight to his station, bent forward, eyes shut. Welcome to Earth. What? The men in the rocket roared. What did he say? Yes, welcome to Earth. It's a trick. Etel shivered opened his eyes to stare in bewilderment at the unseen voice from the ceiling source. Welcome. Welcome to green industrial earth, declared the friendly voice. With open arms, we welcome you to turn a bloody invasion into a time of friendships that will last through all time. A trick. Hush. Listen. Many years ago, we of Earth renounced war, destroyed our atom bombs. Now, unprepared as we are, there is nothing for us but to welcome you. The planet is yours. We ask only mercy from you, good and merciful invaders. It can't be true, a voice whispered. It must be a trick. Land and be welcomed, all of you, said Mr. William Summers of Earth. Land anywhere. Earth is yours. We are all brothers. Etel began to laugh. Everyone in the room turned to see him. The other Martians blinked. He's gone mad. He did not stop laughing until they hit him. The tiny fat man in the center of the hot rocket tarmac at Greentown, California, jerked out a clean white handkerchief and touched it to his wet brow. He squinted blindly from the fresh plank platform at the 50,000 people restrained behind a fence of policemen arm to arm. Everybody looked at the sky. There they are! A gasp. No, just seagulls. A disappointed grumble. <coughs> I'm beginning to think it would have been better to have declared war on them, whispered the mayor. Then we could all go home. Shh, said his wife. There, the, the crowd roared. Out of the sun came the Martian rockets. Everybody ready? The mayor glanced nervously about. Yes, sir, said Miss California, 1965. Yes, said Miss America, 1940 who had come rushing up at the last minute as a substitute for Miss America 1966, who was ill at home. Yes, sirree, said Mr. Biggest Grapefruit in San Fernando Valley 1956, eagerly. Ready, band? The band poised its brass like so many guns. Ready? The rockets landed. Go! The band played. California, here I come, ten times. From noon until one o'clock, the mayor made a speech, shaking his hands in the direction of the silent, apprehensive rockets. At 1.15, the seals of the rockets opened. 
The band played Oh You Golden State three times. Etel and 50 other Martians leaped out, guns at the ready. The mayor ran forward with the key to earth in his hands. The band played Santa Claus is Coming to Town, and a, a full chorus of singers imported from Long Beach sang different words to it, something about Martians are coming to town. Seeing no weapons about, the Martians relaxed but kept their guns out. From 1.30 until 2.15, the mayor made the same speech over for the benefit of the Martians. At 2.30, Miss America of 1940 volunteered to kiss all the Martians if they lined up. At 2.30 and 10 seconds, the band played How Do You Do, Everybody? to cover up the confusion caused by Miss America's suggestion. At 2.35, Mr. Biggest Grapefruit presented the Martians with a two-ton truck full of grapefruit. At 2.37, the mayor gave them all free passes to the elite and majestic theaters, combining this gesture with another speech which lasted until after three. The band played, and to 50,000 people sang, for they are jolly good fellows. It was over at four o'clock. Etel sat down in the shadow of the rocket, two of his fellows with him. So, this is Earth. I say kill the filthy rats, said one Martian. I don't trust them. They're sneaky. What's their motive for treating us this way? He held up a box of something that rustled. What's this stuff they gave to me? A, a, a sample, they said. He read the label. B-L-I-X. The new sudsy soap. The crowd had drifted about, was mingling, and the Martians like a carnival throng. Everywhere was the buzzing murmur of people filling the rockets, asking questions. Etel was cold. He was beginning to tremble even more now. Don't you feel it? He whispered. The tenseness, the evilness of all this. Something's going to happen to us. They have some plan, something subtle and horrible. They're going to do something to us. I know. I say kill every one of them. How can you kill people who call you pal and buddy? Asked another Martian. Etel shook his head. They're sincere. And yet I feel as if we were in a big acid vat melting away. Away. I'm frightened. He put his mind out to touch among the crowd. Yes, they're really friendly. Hail fellows, well met. One of their terms. One huge mass of common men, loving dogs and cats and Martians equally. And yet, and yet, the band played Roll Out the Barrel. Free beer was being distributed through the courtesy of Hagenbach Beer, Fresno, California. The sickness came. The men poured out fountains of slush from their mouths. The sound of sickness filled the land. Gagging, Etel sat beneath a sycamore tree. A plot. A plot. A horrible plot. He groaned, holding his stomach. What did you eat? That Asinor stood over him. Something they call popcorn, groaned Etel. And? And some sort of long meat in a bun, and some yellow liquid in an iced vat, and some sort of fish, and some something called pastrami, sighed Etel, eyes flickering. The moans of the Martian invaders sounded all about. Kill the plotting snakes, somebody cried weakly. Hold on. It's merely hospitality. They overdid it. Up on your feet now, men. Into the town. We've got to place small garrisons of men about to make sure all is well. Other ships are landing in other cities. We've got a job to do here. The men gained their feet and stood blinking stupidly about. Forward march. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. 
the white stores of the little town lay dreaming in shimmering heat. Heat emanated from everything, poles, concrete, metal, awnings, roofs, tar paper, everything. The sound of Martian feet sounded on the asphalt. Careful, men, whispered the Asinur. They walked past a beauty shop. From inside, a furtive giggle. Look! A coppery head bobbed and vanished like a doll in the window. A blue eye glinted and winked at a keyhole. It's a plot, whispered Ethel. A plot, I tell you. The odors of perfume were fanned out on the summer air by the whirling vents of the grottoes, where the women held like, hid like undersea creatures, under electric cones, their hair curled into wild whorls and peaks, their eyes shrewd and glassy, animal and sly, their mouths painted a neon red. Fans were whirring in the perfumed wind issuing upon the stillness, moving among green trees, creeping among the amazed Martians. For God's sake, screamed Ethel, his nerves suddenly breaking loose. Let's get in our rockets. Go home. They'll get us. Those horrid things in there. See them? Those evil undersea things? Those women in their cool little caverns of artificial rock? Shut up. Look at them in there, he thought, drifting their dresses like cool green gills over their pillar legs. He shouted, Someone shut his mouth. They'll rush out on us, hurling chocolate boxes and copies of... Caleb Love and Holly Picture, shrieking with their red, greasy mouths, inundate us with banality, destroy our sensibilities. Look at them, being electrocuted by devices, their voices like hums and chants and murmurs. Do you dare go in there? Why not? asked the other Martians. They'll fry you, bleach you, change you, crack you. Flake you away until you're nothing but a husband, a working man, the one with the money who pays so they can come and sit in there devouring their evil chocolates. Do you think you could control them? Yes, by the gods. From a distance, a voice drifted, a high and shrill voice, a woman's voice saying, ain't that middle one there cute? Martians ain't so bad after all. Gee, they're just men, said another, fading. Hey there, you who Martians, hey! Yelling, Ethel ran. He sat in a park and trembled steadily. He remembered what he had seen. Looking up at the dark night sky, he felt so far from home, so deserted. Even now, as he sat among the still trees, in the distance he could see Martian warriors walking the streets with the earth women vanishing into the phantom darkness of the little emotion places to hear the ghastly sounds of white things moving on gray screens, with little frizz-haired women beside them, wads of gelatinous gum working in their jaws, other wads under the seats, hardening with the fossil imprints of the women's tiny cat teeth forever embedded therein, the cave of wings, the cinema. Hello? He jerked his head in terror. A woman sat on the bench beside him, chewing gum lazily. Don't run off, I don't bite, she said. Oh, he said. Like to go to the pictures, she said. No. Ah, oh, come on, she said. Everybody else is. No, he said. Is that all you do in this world? All? Ain't that enough? Her blue eyes widened suspiciously. Why you want to... What do you want me to do? Sit home? Read a book? <laughs> That's rich. Etel stared at her a moment before asking a question. Do you... Do anything else? He asked. Ride in cars? You got a car? You ought to get you a big new convertible Poddler 6. See? They're fancy. Any man with a Poddler 6 can go out with any gal. You bet, 
she said, blinking at him. I bet you got all kinds of money. You come from Mars and all. I bet if you really wanted to, you could get a Potter Six and travel anywhere. To the show, maybe. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing. You know what you talk like, mister, she said. A communist. Yes, sir, that's the kind of talk nobody stands for, by gosh. Nothing wrong with our little old system. We was good enough to let you Martians invade, and we never raised even our bitty finger, did we? That's what I've been trying to understand, said Ethel. Why did you let us? Because we're big-hearted, mister, that's why. Just remember that. Big-hearted. She walked off to look for someone else. Gathering courage to himself, Ethel began to write a letter to his wife, moving the pen carefully over the paper on his knee. Dear Talia. But again, he was interrupted. A small little girl of an old woman with a pale, round, wrinkled face shook her tambourine in front of his nose, forcing him to glance up. Brother, she cried, eyes blazing, have you been saved? Am I in danger? Ethel dropped his pen, jumping. Terrible danger, she wailed, clanking her tambourine, gazing to the sky. You need to be saved, brother, in the worst way. I am inclined to agree, he said, trembling. We saved lots already today. I saved three myself, of you Mars people. Ain't that nice? She grinned at him. I guess so. She was acutely suspicious. She leaned forward with her secret whisper. Brother, she wanted to know. You been baptized? I, I don't know. He whispered back. You don't know, she cried, flinging up hand and tambourine. Is it like being shot? He asked. Brother, she said, you are in a bad and sinful condition. I blame it on your ignorant bringing up. I bet those schools on Mars are terrible. Don't teach you no truth at all. Just a pack of made up lies. Brother, you got to get baptized if you want to be happy. Will it make me happy even in this world here? he said. Don't ask for everything on your platter, he said. Be satisfied with a wrinkled pea, for there's another world we're all going to that's better than this one. I know that word, he said. It's peaceful, she said. Yes. There's quiet, she said. Yes. There's milk and honey flowing. Why, yes, he said. And everybody's laughing. I can see it now, he said. A better world, she said. Far better, he said. Yes, Mars is a great planet. Mister, she said, tightening up and almost fighting, flinging the tambourine in his face. You've been joking with me? I know. He was embarrassed and bewildered. I thought you were talking about... Not about mean, old, nasty Mars. I tell you, mister, it's your type that is going to boil for years and suffer and break out in black pimples and be tortured. I must admit, Earth isn't very nice. You've described it beautifully. Mister, you're, f <laughs> you're funning me again, she cried angrily. No, no, please. I plead ignorance. Well, she said, you're a heathen and heathens are improper. Here's a paper. Come to this address tomorrow night and be baptized and be happy. We shouts, we stomps, and we talk in voices. So if you want to hear our all cornet, all brass band, you come. Won't you now? I'll try, he said, hesitating, hesitantly. Down the street she went, patting her tambourine, singing at the top of her voice, Happy am I! I'm always happy! Dazed, Ethel returned to his letter. Dear Talia, to think that in my naivete I imagined that the Earthmen would have to counterattack with guns and bombs. No. No, I was sadly wrong. There is no Rick or Mick or Jick or Bannon. Those lover fellows who save worlds? 
No. There are blonde robots with pink rubber bodies. Real, but somehow unreal. Alive, but somehow automatic in all responses. Living in caves all their lives. Their derrieres are incredible in girth. Their eyes are fixed and motionless from an endless time of staring at picture screens. The only muscles they have occur in their jaws from their ceaseless chewing of gum. And it is not only these, my dear Talia, but the entire civilization into which they have been dropped like a shovel full of seeds into a large concrete mixer. Nothing of us will survive. We will be killed not only by the gun, but by the glad hand. We will be destroyed not by the rocket, but by the automobile. Somebody screamed. A crash. Another crash. Silence. Etel leapt up from his letter. Outside, on the street, two ears had crashed. One full of Martians, another with Earthmen. Etel returned to his letter. Dear Talia, a few statistics, if you will allow. 45,000 people killed every year on this continent of America, made into jelly right in the can, as it were, in the automobiles. Red blood jelly, with white marrow bones like sudden thoughts, ridiculous horror thoughts, transfixed in the immutable jelly. The cars roll up in tight, neat sardine rolls. All sauce, all silence. Blood manure for green buzzing summer flies all over the highways. Faces made into Halloween masks by sudden stops. Halloween is one of their holidays. I think they worship the automobile on that night. Something to do with death, anyway. You look out your window and you see two people lying atop each other in friendly fashion who, a moment ago, had never met before. Dead. I foresee our army mashed, diseased, trapped in cinemas by witches and gum. Sometime in the next day, I shall try to escape back to Mars before it is too late. Somewhere on Earth tonight, my Talia, there is a man with a lever, which, when he pulls it, will save the world. The man is now unemployed. His switch gathers dust. He himself plays Pinochle. The women of this evil planet are drowning us in a tide of banal sentimentality, misplaced romance, and one last fling before the makers of glycerin boil them down for usage. Good night, Talia. Wish me well, for I shall probably die trying to escape. My love to our child. Weeping silently, he folded the letter and reminded himself to mail it later at the rocket post. He left the park. What was there to do? Escape? But how? Return to the post late tonight? Steal one of the rockets alone and go back to Mars? Would it be possible? He shook his head. He was much too confused. All that he really knew was that if he stayed here, he would soon be the property of a lot of things that buzzed and snorted and hissed, that gave off fumes or stenches. In six months, he would be the owner of a large pink trained ulcer, a blood pressure of algebraic dimensions, a myopia, this side of blindness, and nightmares as deep as oceans and infested with improbable links of dream intestines, through which he must violently force his way each night. No. No. He looked at the haunted faces of the Earthmen, drifting violently along their mechanical death boxes. Soon, yes, very soon, they would invent an auto with six silver handles on it. Hey there! An auto horn. A large, long hearse of a car, black and ominous, pulled to the curb. A man leaned out. You a Martian? Yes. Just the man I gotta see. Hop in quick. The chance of a lifetime. Hop in. 
take you to a real nice joint where we can talk. Come on, don't stand there. As if hypnotized, Ethel opened the door of the car and got in. They drove off. What'll it be? Evie? How about a Manhattan? Two Manhattans, waiter. Okay. Evie, this is my treat. This is on me and big studios. Don't even touch your wallet. Please to meet you, Evie. My name's R.R. R. Van Plank. Maybe you heard of me. No? Well, shake anyhow. Ethel felt his hand massaged and dropped. They were in a dark hole with music and waiters drifting about. The drinks were set down. It had all happened so swiftly. Now Van Plank, hands crossed on his own chest, was surveying his Martian discovery. What I want you for, E.V., is this. It's the most magnanimous idea I've ever got in my life. I don't know how it came to me. Just a flash. I was sitting home tonight, and I thought to myself, my God, what a picture it would make. Invasion of Earth by Mars. So, what I got to do? I got to find an advisor for the film. So I climbed in my car and found you, and here we are. Drink up. Here's to your health and to our future. Skull. But, said Entel, now, I know, you'll want money. Well, we got plenty of that. Besides, I got a little black book full of peaches I can lend you. I don't like most of your earth fruit, and you're a, you're a card, Mac, really. Well, here's how I get the picture in my mind. Listen. He leaned forward excitedly. We got a flash scene of the Martians at a big powwow, drumming drums, getting strewed on Mars. In the background are huge silver cities. But that's not the way Martian cities are. We've got to have color, kid. Color. Let your pappy fix this. Anyway, there are all the Martians doing a dance around a fire. We don't dance around fires. In this film, you got a fire and you dance, declared Van Pank, eyes shut, proud of his certainty. He nodded, dreaming it over on his tongue. Then we got a beautiful Martian woman, tall and blonde. Martian women are dark. Look, I don't see how we're going to be very happy, Evie. By the way, son, you ought to change your name. What is it again? Ethel. That's a woman's name. And I'll give you a better one. Call you Joe. Okay, Joe? As I was saying, our Martian women are going to be blonde because, see, just because. Or else your papa won't be happy. You got any suggestions? I thought that... And another thing we gotta have is a scene, very tearful, where the Martian woman saves the whole ship of Martian men from dying, and when a meteor something hits the ship, that'll make a wackaroo of a scene, you know? I'm glad I found you, Joe. You're gonna have a you're you're gonna have a good deal with us. I can tell with I can tell you. Etta reached out and held the man's tight wrist. Just a minute. There's something I want to ask you. Oh, sure, Joe, shoot. Why are you being so nice to us? We invade your planet, and you welcome us, everybody, like long-lost children. Why? They sure grow them green on Mars, don't they? <laughs> You're a naive type of guy. I can see from way over here. Mac, look at it this way. We're all little people, aren't we? He waved a small tan hand garnished with emeralds. We're all common as dirt, aren't we? Well, here on Earth, we're proud of that. This is the century of the common man, Bill. And we're proud we're small. Billy, you're looking at it at a planet full of Saurians. Yes, sir. A great big fat family of friendly Saurians. Everybody, loving everybody. We understand you, Martians, Joe, and we know why you invaded Earth. We know how lonely you were up on that little cold planet Mars, how you envied our cities. Our civilization is much older than yours. Please, Joe, you make me unhappy when you interrupt. Let me finish my theory, and then you can talk all you want. 
as I was saying, you was lonely up there, and down you came to see our cities and our women and all, and we welcomed you in because you're our brothers. Come on, common men, like all of us. And then, as kind of a side incident, Roscoe, there's certain little small profit to be had from this invasion. I mean, for instance, this picture I plan, which will net us neat a billion dollars, I bet. Next week, we start putting out a special Martin doll at 30 bucks a throw. Think of the millions there. I also got a contract to make a Martian game to sell for five bucks. <laughs> There's all sorts of angels. I see, said Ethel, drawing back. And then, of course, there's that whole nice new market. Think of all the depilatories and gum and shoe shine we can get to sell to you Martians. Wait, another question. Shoot, what's your first name? What's the RR stand for? Oh, Richard Robert, Ethel looked at the ceiling. Do they sometimes, perhaps, on occasion, once in a while by accident, call you... Rick? How'd you guess, Mac? Rick, sure. Ethel sighed and began to laugh and laugh. He put out his hand. So you're Rick. Rick! So you're Rick? Yeah, well, that's the joke, laughing boy. <laughs> Let Papa in. You wouldn't understand. A private joke. Ha ha ha! Tears ran down his cheeks and into his open mouth. He pounded the table again and again. So you're Rick. Oh, how different. How funny. No bulging muscles, no lean jaw, no gun. Only a wallet full of money and an emerald ring and a big middle. Hey, watch the language. I may not be no Apollo, but... Shake hands, Rick. I've wanted to meet you. You're the man who'll conquer Mars with cocktail shakers and foot archers and poker chips and riding crops and leather boots and checkered caps and rum Collinses. I'm only a humble businessman, said Van Plank, eyes slightly down. I do my work and take my humble little piece of money pie. But as I was saying, Mort... I've been thinking of the market on Mars for Uncle Wiggly games and Dick Tracy comics. All new. A big, wide field, never even heard of cartoons, right? Right? So we just toss a great big bunch of stuff on the Martians' heads. They'll fight for it, kid. Fight! Who wouldn't? For perfumes and Paris dresses and Oshkosh overalls, eh? <laughs> and nice new shoes. We don't wear shoes. What have I got here? R.R. Our, our asked of the ceiling. A planet full of Okies? Look, Joe, we'll take care of that. We'll shame everyone into wearing shoes. Then we'll sell them the polish. Oh. He slapped Edel's arm. Is it a deal? Will you be technical director on my film? Will you get 200 a week? You, you'll get 200 a week, uh, 200 a week to start. A 500 top. What do you say? I'm sick said Ethel. He had drunk the Manhattan and was now turning blue. Say, I'm sorry. I didn't know it would do that to you. Let's get you some fresh air. In the open air, Ethel felt better. He swayed. So that's why Earth took us in. Sure, son. Any time an Earthman can turn an honest dollar, watch him steam. The customer is always right. No hard feelings. Here's my card. Be at the studio in Hollywood tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. They'll show you your office. I'll arrive at 11 and see you then. But sure, you can get there at 9 o'clock. It's a strict rule. Why? Gallagher, you're a queer oyster, but I love you. Good night. Happy invasion. The car drove off. Ethel blinked after it, incredulous. Then, rubbing his brow with the palm of his hand, he walked slowly along the street toward the rocket port. Well, what are you going to do? he asked himself aloud. The rockets lay gleaming in the moonlight silent. From the city came the sounds of distant revelry. In the medicinal compound, in the medical compound, an extreme case of nervous breakdown was being tended to. A young Martian who, by his screams, had seen too much 
drunk too much, heard too many things on the little red and yellow boxes in the drinking places, and had been chased around innumerable tables by a large elephant-like woman. He kept muttering, Can't breathe. Crushed. Trapped. The sobbing faded. Etel came out of the shadows and moved on across a wide avenue toward the ships. Far over, he could see the guards lying about drunkenly. He listened. From the vast city came the faint sounds of cars and music and sirens. And he imagined other sounds, too. The insidious whir of malt machines, stirring malts to fatten the warriors and make them lazy and forgetful. The narcotic voices of the cinema caverns, lulling and lulling the Martians fast, fast into a slumber through which all of their remaining lives, they would sleepwalk. A year from now, how many Martians dead of cirrhosis of the liver, bad kidneys, high blood pressure, suicide? He stood in the middle of the empty avenue. Two blocks away, a car was rushing toward him. He had a choice. Stay here, take the job in the studio, report for work each morning as advisor on a picture. And in time, come to agree with the producer that, yes, indeed, there were massacres on Mars. Yes, the women were tall and blonde. Yes, there were tribal dances and sacrifices. Yes, yes, yes. Or he could walk over and get into a rocket ship and alone return to Mars. But what about next year, he said. The Blue Canal nightclub brought to Mars. The ancient city gambling casino built right inside. Yes, right inside a real Martian ancient city. Neons, racing forms blowing in the old cities. Panic, picnic lunches in the ancestral graveyards. All of it. All of it. But not quite yet. In a few days he would be home. Talia would be waiting with their son. And then for the last few years of gentle life, he might sit with his wife in the blowing weather on the edge of the canal, reading his good, gentle books, sipping a rare and light wine, talking and living out their short time until the neon bewilderment fell from the sky. And then perhaps he and Talia might move into the Blue Mountains and hide for another year or two until the tourists came to snap their cameras and to say how quaint things were. He knew just what he would say to Talia. War is a bad thing, but peace can be a living horror. He stood in the middle of the wide avenue. Turning, it was with no surprise that he saw a car bearing down upon him, a car full of screaming children. These boys and girls, none older than sixteen, were swerving and ricocheting their open-top car down the avenue. He saw them point at him and yell. He heard their motor roar louder. The car sped forward at 60 miles an hour. He began to run. Yes, he thought tiredly. With the car upon him, how strange, how sad. It sounds so much like a... a concrete mixer. Well, thank you for tuning into Storytime Classics Live today. Hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday. And please remember to wear a mask and please stay safe out there.